So would you mind introducing yourself for the audience, please? Sure. Um, so my name is Erin Spencer. Um, I live here in Rhode Island in the States, and I have been a landscape oil painter for, let's see, it's been about 16 years that I've been painting in oils and painting the landscape um, and just love, love, love to paint the landscape. I'm out painting plein air, you know, not every day, but as many days as I can. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've been living here in Rhode Island for about 16 years, just working. We've got three kids, uh, my husband and I, and um, various ages, <laughs> ranging from 15 to seven. And yeah, just living the busy life of a mom, but trying to fit art in every day. So I would say that I'm working full-time as an artist as well, but also full-time as a mom. <laughs> so it's pretty busy, but but really enjoyable. And yeah, just kind of plugging away at that. So <laughs> Wonderful. So Erin, I've known about your work for many years now, it seems. And I, I first saw it, I think on Pinterest, like, and it seems oh, wow. like, like pre-Instagram days. And um, I was always drawn to it because it, I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. And I don't know if you remember that we, we had a sort of conversation on Instagram years ago because yeah. you came over to England, to Lincolnshire yes. and painted here. And I think, you know, what caught me about your work in the first place was that it's, it's very European. It, <laughs> oh, <that's... laughs> it, it has, it has that, um, it's in that tradition of say constable in the sense. Mm. How how much of that style of art influenced you? Oh yeah, I mean a lot. I would say I I didn't study art in school, so I I actually studied like archaeology and history in college, and that was really where my passion was from like my late teens into high school, um, or I mean into college where I was really interested in, in those subjects and things like that. But, and so I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily looking at a ton of art, um, in those years in person, you know, I mean, I, we all get exposed to art in different ways in our lives, but, um, it was really, so I actually in college at some point during college, I decided to go on a mission for my church and I ended up in the Netherlands. And so I, I lived there for 18 months and, served, you know, did service there and worked with people in the church there and things like that. And it was a great experience, really, um, I would say like a very life affirming experience, a very um, enlarging experience spiritually um, for me. But also, I think it, I also became kind of more um, aware of some of those European influences, whether it's art or just the landscape and just the history and the culture. Um, and the language. Um, so I, I, I learned to speak Dutch when I was there. So I, I speak Dutch still. I wouldn't say I'm as fluent as I once was, but um, so I don't know. I became kind of interested in European culture, I guess, more so at that during that time. Um, and I didn't bring home very many souvenirs from my time there, but I remember a couple of the things that I brought. One was just this print that I had picked up in some secondhand shop in the Netherlands and it was a landscape painting with the figure in it but of the ocean and and I think when I started to look more at art later um, when I started to become more interested in in painting that was the art that I was kind of most drawn to were these landscapes by these old masters like some of the Dutch old masters but but even like some of the British masters where there was so much open space big yes. skies the the vistas and I, that was always really I guess peaceful for me to look at and I love the tonal quality of so many of those pieces they really draw me in even from a distance I feel like seeing art like that in a museum even from a distance yeah I'm really yeah. drawn towards it you know yeah so like just the muted colors and and that kind of thing so I think I tend to be a really anxious person and like um like I'm, I'm kind of always like <laughs> processing things in my mind and like analyzing a lot of things. And I think sometimes that kind of art is just very soothing for me. <laughs> mm, mm. Um, and it just forces me to slow down and think and internalize, I guess a little bit. So yeah, um, that's, that was something I was definitely drawn to a lot 
when I would see art in person. Um, so in that regard, I guess that's kind of yeah. why my work tends that direction. Yeah, it's a, and as a tangent on that, um, when, when you're painting and you're sort of creating this vision maybe of something that calms you down, that you find that, that grounding or that vast space in which you can kind of lose yourself. Do um, people who see your work, your collectors, what do they say? What What's the kind of the, the feeling that it evokes for them? Is it something similar? I feel the feedback that I've gotten is, is that it is similar yeah. to that. I think for some people it is, I, I, I hear those words frequently, I guess, peaceful, calming. Um, and then I think for some people too, there's a little bit of like a nostalgia connected mm. with the pieces that they tend to, you know, my collectors tend to buy. Um, I think the landscape in that way is really, really special to me because it is very universal. Um, everywhere you live, there's a landscape and a lot of places in the world, there's just, there's a lot of similarities there. And so I'll be, I'll maybe have a painting that's from England and the person just, it makes them feel like their hometown in the Midwest of the United States, yeah. you know? So like, just depending on the, the actual view, sometimes it's very specific, but mostly a landscape I think can be more abstracted. Mm. It doesn't necessarily have to be mm. um, tied down to a specific place. Um, and I think the way that I paint landscapes also kind of, it, they're very simplified and I don't necessarily try to um, depict the exact you know, yes. location or anything like that, yeah. but um, yeah. more just the feeling of a place that, that I had and things like that. So I do feel like people have, can have a connection to place, mm -hmm. even if it's not necessarily of that mm -hmm. specific place. But I also think when I finally tell someone where something is, they'll be like, oh, well, if that's where it is, that I want that, you know, so <laughs> yeah, it kind of yeah. depends. Like sometimes yeah. they'll be like, oh, where is this painting from? And I'll say, it's, oh, I painted that in the Cotswolds. And then they'll say, oh, I was just there. Or yes, I would love yeah. to have a memory of that. So I think it can be different things in that way. Yeah. But I do feel like the landscape is pretty universal. So I yeah, like that. I agree <laughs> with you. Um, it's interesting that I, I sell mostly to the States, you know, so most of my landscapes sell there um yeah. Yeah. and I try not to some sometimes I will give them the name of the location but mm -hmm. I like this universal language that it's that there's something about the sky um the sea yeah. the, the clouds that really does speak to us on this this sort of universal level um, and I find it fascinating and I think as well with with your work because it is so poetic as well that you're not um, you're not filling in the details. You're not describing, but you're you're more you're creating this poem so people can romanticize more and see in it what they want to see. Yeah, I love that. Um, there's a painting that I that I did I think in England, um, and just like the it was kind of near a stone circle. Um, I don't remember where we were. It was in the Cotswolds mm -hmm. and. Um, oh, it, was, oh, no. it wasn't Stonehenge, but it was somewhere, <laughs> another, another stone circle. It was yeah. more tucked away somewhere, but um, it was anyway, the painting that I did just like, I think the title that I gave it was something along the lines of, you know, sky over an ancient land. And I just, I just think that is something that is really exciting to me about being in the landscape, something I've thought about a lot. I think when I feel most excited about my work is when not necessarily when I'm just depicting something and translating it, but when I feel a connection to it. Um, and I think that happens for me when I paint plein air a little bit sometimes where I can feel a little bit more connected to it. And that way I'm responding to it. It's, it's a part of an experience and that experience that I'm having. Um, I don't know. I just think we're all so connected to the land, whether we necessarily feel that or not. Mm -hmm. But I think if we give ourselves that opportunity, I think we can feel that we've been here before. Like our ancestors have been here before, you know, like when I came out to England for that trip that you had mentioned before, when I went to Lincolnshire, um, it was with my parents and it was a trip to do a family history tour. Basically we have most of our family, my dad's side of the family, um, came a lot of them came from that area and so and he had a lot of research that he had so it was a really neat experience to go through and look at these different churches and villages where they had lived um and to feel this connection to the land that 
they had known, you know, just a couple generations ago, mm-hmm. um, back in the late, the late 1800s is when many of them came over to America. And so I don't know, like I have a great grandfather whose name was Fenton and he was named that because of the Fens. Um, he was uh-huh. named that because he, his parents had come from the Fens, you know, of that uh-huh. part of England yeah. and with the yeah. fields and everything. And when we went there to visit, it was just this neat experience. I never knew him. He passed away before I was born, but my dad knew him. And so mm-hmm. my dad, you know, being on this land and looking at my parents and taking pictures of them, I'm like, these look like just two British people to me. Like <laughs> When I look back at the photos of them, I'm like, oh, they're just a couple of British people just hanging out, but they're not, you know, but it, it's just kind of fun to see that mm-hmm. thread, I guess, kind of come through mm-hmm. and, and realize this is the land that my ancestors Yes. from and, and lived on and it was a really enriching experience to paint yes. there and and to and to paint it as well that uh, I often feel this so you know I'm surrounded by these huge clouds and a lot of the scenes that I see around here are exactly what someone would have seen 200 years ago and it's it's this incredible feeling and I think especially through painting that and your series from from when you painted there, your ancestors would have seen almost a similar scene. And because you're you're sort of putting it down to its poetic essence, it's kind of much closer to that. You know, if you were putting modern cars in and stuff, it, it wouldn't yeah. be. But because you you have that poetic visual language of doing it, it really is a way of of connecting and bringing the past into the now and vice versa. Yeah. And I, you know, I see so many artists that I really admire that are painting, you know, plein air and they are doing what they see. They're doing, there are the cars, the people, the, and I love those pieces too. I mean, sometimes I look at work like that and I think, Oh, I wonder if I could paint that way. It's just so it's, it's exciting and it's vibrant and spontaneous Mm -hmm. and things. Um, but I think I just tend to always be drawn back to, and I mean, maybe this kind of says something about what I studied in college. Like I studied archaeology and, you know, yeah. and I was, I'm just very like, um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess what I, what personally just comes out of me is more this kind of nostalgia, I guess, and hearkening back to a simpler time maybe, but also just the beauty of the landscape itself and how that is something that's that's just a part of all of our lives and and has been a part of of all of our lives for all those all these generations and um yeah I, I don't know it's exciting to me and I think there's just so many neat things you can do with the landscape in terms of like abstraction and paint application which I think when I look back to when I what really started me with painting it was looking at original art in life um it was actually a friend of mine that was had studied art in school, but ended up teaching um, and then wanted to transition to doing her art full time. So she decided to do an open house in her home and just show her work and try to jumpstart a career, you know? And so I went to that open house and I walked through and I saw all of her art and I'm looking at it probably just more in um, sincerely than I'd, that I'd ever really looked at art in a gal- in a museum or a gallery mm-hmm. before, for whatever reason, I think just because I had that connection with her and I'm looking more closely at it. And I just, I had a visceral reaction to the paint, <laughs> like just the paint on the surface of That's these it. panels and canvases. And I, I was mesmerized by it. Mm-hmm. And I just thought, wow, I want to do that. Like, I really want to do that. It was a tangible visceral reaction for me that I wanted to like get my hands on some paint, you know, immediately. And I remember walking out of her open house and I turned to my husband and I said, That's what I'm going to do. That's what I want to do. <laughs> Wow. And the next day I went out and bought, you know, cheap paint, cheap canvases. I had no idea what I was doing and got a couple books from the library probably or something. And I just started painting actually photographs from my time in the Netherlands. And mm-hmm. most of my pictures from that time were landscapes. You know, they were just the beautiful scenery, beaches and the grassy dunes and the polder land, you know, just all the flat land, yeah. you know, the big skies. So I started painting all of that. and you know, terribly obvious <laughs> at the beginning, but yeah. that was, I think it was all about the paint initially. It was the paint yeah. and like how to manipulate it and how exciting that was to me. Um, and feeling like there's such a 
so many possibilities. And I still mm-hmm. feel like that opens up more and more to me. The more I paint, I realize, oh my goodness, all the possibilities. So yeah. Yeah. the exciting part. Yeah. They're endless. They're absolutely endless. And it is, that's what sort of, um, that physicality of paint, you know, like you were saying there, I, I fell in love with that as well. Simon, do, do you have a question? Because I've got so many, I could just carry okay, on. Okay, I can tell. I'm happy for you to lead. But I was curious is, how long did it take you to develop this intuition about the editing that you will make with a landscape in order to find that essence that you capture in your in your paintings? How long did that take to develop in your practice? Yeah, I mean, when I look back, even early in some of those paintings that I was doing that were right at the beginning, you know, where I really had no training at all. I mean, I guess even to this day, I don't necessarily have training, but it's just a lot of experience under my belt. Um, but which I guess in a way is, is its own kind of training, you know, we learn as we go. But um, even then, I think I was always drawn to a very simplified um, landscape. I think even the photos that I was that I was working from initially in those very early paintings were very simple photos. And so I think it just kind of says a little bit, I guess, about what I, what I was drawn to, even, even just in my photo, t- you know, the pictures I chose to take and even the editing that I was doing when I was taking those pictures. But I think, um, yeah. So over time, um, I've learned a lot more about composition. I've learned a lot more about, um, I guess having the courage. So, so I think not being trained, you know, not having gone to art school, um, not having really taken a lot of workshops or anything like that from other artists, other artists, I, um, I have always felt like in the beginning, I felt constrained by my lack of talent, you know, my, my lack of ability. And so I tended to do things that were easier that I thought that I thought were going to be easier to do, um, like a flat horizon, you know, just little things like that, where I look back on some of those older paintings and maybe I used, I utilized a lot of those elements in my work because it was easier. But then as time has gone on, I've had to adopt this idea of like, just being courageous, you know, being brave about what I want to depict. Like when I see something, I guess part, a lot of it for me is learning to see. So learning to see in a way that isn't so much like when I look out there, I don't necessarily, I'm looking out my window when I say that I, I don't necessarily look at that and think that's a tree and those are the leaves, but more thinking of it in terms of shapes. Um, so, I mean, you can't name the shape because there's no yeah. name for that shape, you know, but just what is that shape and how would I depict that in a painting? And, and so I think for me, composition comes down to those, those shapes that I'm putting on that two-dimensional surface, taking from the three-dimensional world, putting it in a two-dimensional space and thinking about how those shapes interact with each other, um, how they create harmony with one another or even how you can disrupt that harmony with a little bit of dissonance to create interest, um, breaking up some of those shapes in different ways. Um, value is a big part of it. When I teach workshops, I think that's, I start with the idea of observation and learning to see, but we can't spend all of our time just observing. If we're not implementing what we're, what we think we're seeing, then we're not really going to continue to see differently and see better. Um, so I think for me, the, it kind of is a cyclical process where I have to spend time observing and then I have to spend time trying to implement what I've observed. Yes. Yeah. And then that helps me to see even better the next time I go and look, you know, because I'm able to see how those shapes interact and how they play together. And then I can go back out into the landscape and maybe I see more shapes, more nuanced shapes than I saw before. And I'm able to put that in the next time when I go back into my painting and So I think it's just, it's a process of a lot of looking. Um, And when I look, when I, when I work on a painting, I often teach this as well, that I'm not trying to replicate what I'm seeing necessarily. I'm not trying to replicate the view right before me, but I'm trying to take what I'm seeing. And when the painting itself has to stand on its own, it's not going to be viewed in that space, you know, in front of this landscape. So whoever's looking at that painting, it has to be, it has to stand on its own. And so I think at least for me in the beginning, you feel kind of responsible to put everything in there. You know, you're like, Oh, I need to put what I'm, what I'm seeing in exactly how I see it. But, 
I think having that freedom to, um, I guess, find those simple shapes and put them together how you feel like they should go together in the painting and creating a composition that can stand on its own, I guess. So. And do you find over time the your confidence with doing that it grows where you're less um, worried about perfection and and much more happy to sometimes let things be just through a brush mark or something like that because when um, when we first start painting um, and I often see this when I'm teaching as well people are wanting to put in every single detail and a big part of it is is sort of trying to um, help them with that idea of abstraction and letting certain things go for, for the greater picture. Do you find yourself um, being more, more confident and more sort of fluent in a sense when, when you're painting? Yeah, I think, I think there's a level of that confidence or, you know, and maybe also because after observing for so long and looking and, you know, trying to implement that in paintings, mm. um, I, I don't know if I would call it like intuition, like to what feel, yeah. like it's hard for me. So sometimes when I'm teaching people, want, how, I think some students, and this is just different for everyone. I think every artist is going to be different. I think some artists want kind of that academic side of compositional theory, yes. you know, like they kind of want to know that this painting fits into a, you know, a composition that, that works, um, or like a, a structure, you know, a compositional structure that, that kind of like has worked for many artists or something like that, you know, like Edgar Payne has a book all about composition, painting out, out, you know, the landscape. And, and so I'll, re I'll reference that sometimes because I know that there's some students that they learn that way. Yeah. Like they, they want to kind of know about these different rules. Um, and I just have never, really thought about it that much in that way I think for me I've always just I mean and you can probably see this if you look back at old work of mine you know you can see yeah. like oh she was trying to figure this out you know yeah. um but I I don't know I think I think a lot of it is like if I'm honest I guess I would say like well this just feels good <laughs> this just yes. feels right to me in this painting um and so I do also like to and I think initially when I first started painting I I would, and this still happens to me where you get to, you're not able to paint what you really want to paint. You know, you're not able to do what you really want to do. Um, that happened a lot more earlier on, but I think now it still continues to happen, which I think is a good place to be because I, I feel like when I get frustrated with my work, it usually means that I'm able to see a little bit more and a little bit better than I'm able to, to implement. Yeah. And so to me, that's a good place to be because that shows that I'm stretching and growing Absolutely. and that. Kind of like I said before, that cycle will kind of continue to play out where it's like now I'm seeing more and I'm frustrated that I can't get it in my paintings. And so I'll keep working at that to keep trying to get that to show through in my work. And then I'll be able to do that, hopefully, eventually, you know, um, and then maybe I'll even get, start to see again in a new way, in, a, in yes. a better way, a little bit deeper. So, yeah, I think that there's some confidence that comes, but I also feel like there's just, it's almost like a greater responsibility with every painting, yeah. you know? Well, you just raise, raise the bar each yeah. time or move the goalposts. And and mm -hmm. I, I see that in the game through teaching where um, you know, people are getting like, frustrated about this one thing. It happened in a uh, class this morning. And I said, but when you come here like six months ago, you know, you were frustrated immediately and didn't have the skills to get to this point that you're now getting. Now you're getting frustrated about you know, something so almost irrelevant to the whole thing. But it, they, each time they've just got that little bit higher. And I think a lot of painting is about that because if, if we were completely content and satisfied, what incentive would there be to, yeah. to, to do it? Yeah. Oh, I, I, that is to me, I think one of the most exciting things about yeah. being an artist. Um, and even with this medium that I have kind of been drawn to with oil painting. Um, I mean, there's, there's such, so much beautiful art out there. Like I'm always amazed at how much I don't know, yeah. <laughs> even about the art that's been created in the world. You know, when I stumble yeah. upon a new artist that's new to me or something and 
And I'm thinking, wow, <laughs> like blows my mind, you know, that this artist created this work, or maybe it's a contemporary artist that's creating something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's exciting to me, I guess. It, it just feels um, like a natural extension for me. I, I, I guess I've always had, so, I'm, I've always been wanting to make something in my life, you know, whether it's painting. Before I was painting, I was really interested in like woodworking. Like I wanted to build stuff all the time and I was finding scrap wood on the side of the road. I mean, it, I've, I've always had these inclinations to make things. Mm. And, and I think that's a very human quality for us to want to create. And we do it in such a variety of ways, but this for me has just been so fulfilling. And I wake up, I mean, I don't, I don't rush into my studio every day and like start painting frantically or anything there's days where it's a huge slog to get in there and Mm -hmm. you know gear like work my work the courage up to get in there and do it depending on what what's what I'm working on you know but um but it's just such a fulfilling experience to look at the work that I that I'm working on or that I've done and and to I don't know just to realize like I I made that you know it's exciting to me not that I love everything that I've made but you know what I'm saying like yeah I I don't know. I I just think it's a really thrilling experience. And I I guess what's exciting about it to me, and I don't know that there's many other things in my life that I feel the same way about that. I, I realize there's no end goal. Like there's no um, finish line. Uh, And it's not a race, you know, it's not a race against other artists. It's not a race against myself. There's no finish line, I guess in some ways, because there's no finish line, it can't be a race. Right. So I love that. I just love that like the sky is the limit literally with, yeah. with art and it's, and it's something you don't different. retire from. Um, yeah. Fred, so Fred coming, you know, Fred coming, the English painter, I mean, yeah. he died last year at 90, right. 92, 93, but still painting every day, still painting. right up into the, to the last. And I, I think that's one of those wonderful things about painting is it's, you know, it's both an obsession and a, and a pleasure and a career and, um it, there's no there's no end date to it as well really. yeah so we talked earlier about you moving to Rhode Island from Utah did you paint in Utah as well was that where you started painting yeah I started painting in Utah um so we we were there I want to say it was 2007 when I started painting um and like I had said before, I just kind of went out, bought all these cheap paints and things and came home to our little basement apartment that we were living in. And we had a fold out table. We didn't even have a dining table at the time. We were still fairly newlyweds. And I just started painting on this little fold out table in our little living room. And um, yeah, we, and it was about, I would say, I want to say like maybe eight months later, we had our first little boy, uh, our our first child. And we have adopted all three of our children. So he, we adopted our first, um, in 2008. And so, um, and it was only about six months after that, that we moved to Rhode Island. So it was a busy kind of time in our lives, um, with him being so little and a big cross country move. Um, and I actually made a decision right after he was born that I would put all this, all my painting stuff away. I mean, at this point I was, it was really a hobby, you know, it was really just something I was doing for fun. Um, I had a good friend that saw some of my, those kind of first initial paintings that I was doing. And she said, Oh, you should try to sell these. And looking back, if I, I mean, I never want to say I would do anything differently because I'm really grateful for the trajectory of how things have worked out for me and my, with my art career Um, I never set out for it to be that, um, I guess in the beginning, um, but she said, you should try to sell these. And she recommended Etsy to me, which was kind of a newer thing at the time. Now it's a very different platform than it used to be, but it used to be all had to be handmade things, you know? So a lot of artists were on there selling their paintings and things like that. And, you know, like for good or bad, you could look at it different ways the platforms that are available to artists are so wonderful now that we have such broad access to a wide audience through the internet, you know, through social media with Instagram. But at the time, Etsy was a great platform for that. Um, But there is obviously no gatekeeping involved, you know, so there's no holds bar, you know, anyone can put whatever they want up there and whether it's good or bad. And sometimes I look back at those 
early pieces that people were buying from me. And I think, oh, those poor souls that own these paintings, you know, they're going to all end up in a thrift store one day. I'm sure somebody will <laughs> buy them for a dollar and paint over them or I don't know. They're in the trash. I'm sure a lot of them, but um, you know, I'm selling, I, I started putting things on there probably not until quite a bit later, but I had remembered her recommendations and I was like, oh, I'm going to see about that. You know, I had a, another friend that had bought a painting and my parents bought a couple paintings. Actually the first painting I sold on Etsy, I was so excited. I go to look and it's my mom and I'm like, <laughs> Jeez. I'm like well, that's great. Um, but you know, it, I think for me, like if I, like, I, I don't want to say I would do it differently. Like I said before, but looking back, I, I wonder if it would have been beneficial for me to kind of have a little more incubation time for myself with my art before really trying to put it out there. But I think for me also, it was a really big motivation to see that there was an interest in some of the things I was doing. And it gave me like a lot of incentive to continue to work, even though I was very driven in my painting and I loved doing it. I was painting a lot in those early days as well. I've, I've always been, I guess, a pretty prolific painter. I've always, I guess I would say I've been pretty obsessed with it from the beginning. And that really hasn't waned very much. That hasn't changed a lot for me. Um, there've been a lot of other hobbies I've had in my life that have not had the yeah. staying power, you know, that painting has had in my life. Now the painting is a hobby now, but you know what I mean? Like in the beginning, having it be just this hobby, I, I was surprised, but I think part of the reason why it had that staying power is because I felt like it had value to mm -hmm. others as well. It had value in the world. And, um, there was an interest there for people to have these paintings in their homes and things. So yeah, it really was motivational for me, I guess, in that way. So you can become, <laughs> it's one of those things people often say when they start painting and I've met lots of people who started painting in lockdown and, oh, yeah. um, and it become, they become obsessed and it's, it's, it is a strange thing. I don't know many other hobbies in that sense that, that have that pull. And I mean, I wanted to ask you about, and you were talking about Etsy there. Um, and something I've always admired about you is you you have carved your own way. Do you do you work with galleries now or are you still sort of mainly independent? Tell us a bit so, about that. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. And I feel like I'm a little bit at a transitional point for myself mm. right now. Um, yeah, I have worked with galleries in the past. So I've had a, a few kind of more long-term gallery relationships. Um, yeah. That I guess, I guess when I say that, I mean, <clears throat> I've worked with galleries in the past where I've given them work and they've, you know, hung it, hung it in their galleries and it's been there for a longer period of time um, rather than, but I've also done a lot of things with galleries where I've done shows that they'll have and things like that, but it's yeah. not necessarily a long-term relationship. I have always felt I've always tried, I guess, to put my work out there in a variety of different ways. So I've, I've kind of, from the beginning, had a little bit of that online presence. And I think that was really beneficial for me because I think a lot of other artists have the opposite um, trajectory where they kind of get involved in their local art scene first. Um, and then they branch out, they want, and then they kind of think, how can I branch out? You know, how can I find a wider audience? And for me, for whatever reason, it was almost the opposite where I had kind of this online audience, um, people that were finding my work via Etsy, my website. I had a blog back in the blogging days. Mm -hmm. um, and I had people that were kind of, I was connecting with through those avenues, but they obviously were not local to me. You know, these people were mm -hmm. even, even some of them overseas, um, a lot of people just around the country here. Um, and that was exciting to me. And it also just felt like that's what everyone all the artists were doing, but yeah. I came to find out that that wasn't necessarily true. And I thought, oh, I need to like tap into what's going on around me here because I was shipping paintings, you know, and I, and that has still stayed the main source, I guess, of my income as an artist is, uh, is not through local avenues necessarily. So, but, um, I started doing, you know, I did like a couple of a couple of years in a row or a few years in a row, I did like street festivals. So I had a tent, I had the whole outdoor setup thing. You know, this was in the early days with my art. That is such a hustle. <laughs> it is yeah. so much work. And I admire artists that continue to have that to be like a major part of their business structure, their business model. Cause that's a lot of work. Um, 
calling your paintings back and forth, you know, but I loved that I took all those opportunities because it gave me connections to people that I wouldn't have otherwise found. Um, and that also connected me to the first galleries that I worked with um, because some of those gallery directors and managers would be going around to some of those kinds of shows and they would meet you and things like that. And, and I was always trying to put my work into juried shows um, to see if I was, you know, just to kind of have that peer review a little bit of your work to feel, I guess that that's always been important to me to have, um, to not just put my work out into the world and be like, I love it. So I don't care what other people think of it. I mean, I guess it would be dishonest for me to say that I don't care what other people think about my work. I, I, I feel like it's a, a huge honor to feel that I have not just the approval, but like the admiration of my peers, you know, my artistic peers. Um, that is a huge, a, that is a big amount of fulfillment for me as an artist um, to feel that. And so I've always had that attempt to put my work into different juried shows, whether they're local or national juried shows and things like that. Um, and I've had various, you know, levels of success with that over the years, you know, sometimes you get a painting in a show and most times you don't, you know, but those were good experiences for me. And then to go to those show openings. So I, I've had those kinds of relationships with galleries over the years, the long-term relationships that I've had. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to speak negatively about anyone in particular, but they haven't always felt um, extremely beneficial, um, on one, on the one hand. Um, and I don't know if that's because I had kind of built up an audience and a collector base of my own. And so I felt that, I guess for me at this stage, I, I would love to find opportunities to have my work in, in a gallery or, or anywhere, you know, where it's going to gain a wider audience than maybe what I feel like I could yeah garnish on my own you know yeah um so yeah that's kind of like where I feel like I'm at now and I I have been really I feel really fortunate and really grateful for the platforms that I've been able to find success um mostly Instagram has been a really big game changer yeah. for my business model I guess I mean it kind of accidentally happened that way I just I got on Instagram I want to say like 2016 something like that. Um, and I had kind of always heard about Instagram and the side, you know, but I never really knew much about it. And I, I was just anti-social media generally. I, and I've been this way about all the new technology. I, I didn't, I refused to get a digital camera for like five years. My husband's <laughs> like, just get a digital camera. Finally, I get a digital camera. And then I was, and then I would just bad mouth the thing. Cause I'm like, now I have so many pictures that I never print out, you know, <laughs> and that <laughs> stayed true. <laughs> And then it's like every little technology has been the same. And I was totally boycotting all the social media, but I had a, another friend that had gotten on Instagram um, and it was just talking about how great it was for visual artists. And I thought, oh, I wonder if that's a good place for me to try to post about some of my work. Cause I'd done Pinterest a little bit and things like that. So I started with Instagram and I guess the rest is history. I don't know. Yes. It became quite um, engrossing, you know, for me, yeah. but yeah. And it's like, I, I don't have a, like a hate relationship. It's not like a love hate relationship fully, but it's, it's a little fraught. Um, I, it's a wonderful tool, but it's really hard to feel like you're in control of that tool. So mm -hmm. sometimes you feel like it's just controlling you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I understand. Big balance there. So that's just kind of, I don't know. I just feel like in the beginning I was taking every opportunity that came my way. And I feel like that was really good for me. And that's advice I would probably give to a lot of artists. Um, take all the opportunities, you know, do all the different shows, do the, do the outdoor shows, do the juried shows, you know, go on Instagram, do it all. Um, but I think I'm sort of at a point where I feel like I need to make more deliberate decisions about the direction that I'm going to go. So I don't know what those decisions are going to be necessarily mm -hmm. at this stage, but kind of in that transition period. So I just want to go quickly back to that. Um, you talked earlier about an incubation period. Um, and this is something I, you know, I value a lot. Um, for a long time, I didn't put my work out there and I would look at um, sort of sites like Saatchi Art or even Etsy or something and you kind of think, you know, I'm not ready and I don't want to put it on there just yet because the internet doesn't forget, right? You know, so you still see those images in some time. But 
I tend to now, if I'm working with artists and teaching, will always sort of recommend just holding back a little bit, um, incubating, mm -hmm. especially before you start selling, mm -hmm. you know, online. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we sort of only know this really then in hindsight, like you were saying, mm -hmm. you, you wish you, <laughs> you had. But what advice would you give to someone who is who is painting and they feel like they're getting there and they're, they're sort of getting, you know, some good feedback on Instagram or whatever. Um, would, would you say to them, you know, launch yourself now, start selling now or hold back and let's disregard any financial stuff that they say, well, I, I need to. Right. Or something like that. right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think the advice would maybe depend on the individual mm. and their circumstances, but I guess I think about, uh, and it's so hard to to want to give this advice when you kind of feel like you're in a place where you're a little bit established with your yes. art. And so it's like, I, I would hope that I wouldn't tell my old self to not do the things that I did. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of hard to know. Yeah. Um, I, and, and I really have, I, I, I guess I have a lot of different thoughts about this, that the gatekeeping that happens in the art world, I think has a place in a way, but I think it depends on the goals of the artists themselves. Um, um, so I guess to me, I think the beauty of the world that we live in today is that if you want to be an artist, you can be an artist. Like you can go out there, you can put your work out and you're going to get, um, okay, this is, this is kind of where it comes down to for me is that the, the, the more I've painted, the more I've really gone deeper into my own art appreciation and understanding of what I personally feel makes art beautiful. Um, I know that there's a lot of your average lay collectors, you know, out there that, that don't necessarily have that same mm. feeling about art. You know, they're, they're, they're buying art at the department store, you know, and they're like, this is great. I'm going to put it above my couch and it's, it's all I ever wanted, you know? Um, and the thing that I had an artist recently say that they went into someone's home and there was the, the art that they had was just kind of tacky. They were just like, Oh, you bought this at like, you know, a craft store, you know, whatever. And then they went in the other room and they had this amazing painting, this like original oil painting from this amazing artist. I don't remember who the artist was now, but she's like, what a difference, you know, like, why are they drawn to both of these things? Mm -hmm. You know, like what's, what is it in this art that they love about both of these things, you know? Um, and so I don't know, like, so, this is not answering your question, but it's, I'm off on a tangent, but I'll get back. But another thought that just came into my mind was um, during, like in the, in the late 1800s, like in Europe, like even like in the Netherlands and in England, like uh, middle-class people, even people who were like a little bit lower middle-class often had fine art in their homes or original paintings maybe it was just something small and it was, it was kind of like their crowning glory, you know, to have this beautiful little painting because they valued that beautiful work, you know, and they, there was a place for that in their home, uh, a place of honor for that in their home. And I just think today, maybe it, I just, I love the idea of educating people on what makes art beautiful. And that's going to be different for everybody. Everybody has different tastes and different feelings. And I think if you, if they feel like they love it, that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, it says something to them, you know, something specific, but original art, I think is super important. I just think educating people on having original art in their home is just, it's this tangible, mm -hmm. real artifact from the mm -hmm. artists themselves, something that was created from within somebody that they put out into the world. I just think that stuff is so valuable to have yeah. in our homes. Um, and so in that regard, I, I guess the thoughts that I have for people that are looking into putting their work out there if they're really just doing it because they, let me think here. I think um, to not put your work out because you just lack confidence, that's not a good reason to not put it out there. If you feel like it's, if you feel like you're still learning and you don't want to put it out yet, I think that's okay too. And I think people yeah. need to be a little discerning about that. I think it's really hard to be discerning about that though. <laughs> so I guess, yeah. I guess my, my thoughts are, to just recognize, oh, I guess just to recognize that mm -hmm. success doesn't come overnight. No. Uh, maybe it does for some people, but most of us, that is not true. And yeah. so 
if they really want to succeed in sharing their work with the world, they have to really be in it for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of glad that I didn't really know that at the time (laughs) because I didn't feel hindered at all to put my work out into the world. Um, There was no social media when I started sharing my work. I mean, not really, you know, not in the way that there is now. Um, I had nothing to compare it to other than art that I might see in a museum. You know, I wasn't seeing art in my Instagram feed 24 hours a day, you know, back in that time. And so I was really just being influenced by the little snippets of art that I was gleaning on my very own from the internet. Um, and just artists that were more local to me that I kind of knew about. Um, and I was aspiring to kind of the aesthetic that I liked about their work. I was kind of aspiring to some of those similar Mm -hmm. things, but I wasn't comparing myself continually with other people or even their success. Cause I had no idea what their success was. Now it's so much more visible. Like if I release a series of paintings, I know that people will go on and look and see how many have I sold. I've (laughs) done it. You know, we've, we've all kind of done that. We're like, oh man, they have, they're having a lot of success or they'll see like, huh, they usually do, but they've only sold one painting, (laughs) you know, (laughs) moving on. So it's just, I just think it's a different world. And so I don't, I don't know what I would do in this day and age, because like I said, when I was putting my work out there, it didn't feel, it didn't have that same feeling of like, I don't know what, how it would be different for me if I was putting my work out now today. I I guess maybe that's the hesitation I have because I don't know the difference. Mm. I don't know how that might be different now. yeah. Instagram think, changes. I I, Instagram oh, changed everything. Yeah, it has. Yeah. I did want to ask actually about how, because oh, the social media has this um, way of influencing how you present your work online because it's a square format. So that's a consideration of how do I capture someone's um, attention when yeah. everyone is scrolling so quickly and everything just disappears so fast. Has that factored into how you consider presenting your work and how you, you know, consider presenting yourself as an artist? Is that, has that changed? Because Pinterest was the same, it wasn't, it was still square tiles really where. I think it was, was Pinterest different from, I can't remember. Maybe yeah, I, I don't remember maybe. either. I, I haven't put on Pinterest in a long time, but um, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I actually have an app on my phone that allows me to, um, take my images and put them into a square format, but I can still fit the whole image that I want to put on there That's brilliant. into that square. So I, I use that sometimes too, in order to show like the whole piece what is that, that I want to, it's the one, the app you said. Yeah. Just cause people might that, need to know that. Yeah. The app that I use is called no crop. No crop. I think it has other uses, but that's what I use it for. Um, Fantastic. and so it'll basically take there's other like Canva is another one that I think yeah. you can use. Anyway, there's, there's probably a bunch, yeah. but yeah. Um, but it's, it's a tool that I use sometimes for that kind of thing. Um, but, but even still it it is, but everything still is in these little squares, you know, that you see. And so, yeah, you know, I don't know that I'm even that good at it. <laughs> I mean, somehow I've like, I've got a significant base of followers on Instagram. Um, now I don't know how many of them see my work with how Instagram's algorithms are, mm-hmm. but, um, but I, so something is going well. I don't know exactly what it is. I think maybe it's the consistency. I'm, I'm, I post almost every day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it helps that I am a pretty prolific painter. So I've, I do have a lot of work to show, mm-hmm. you know, and sometimes I'll show older things, you know, I, I, I try to put something on every day, but um, so I think the way that I think it has helped me and it has hindered me. So I think the ways that it's helped me is it gives me a little bit of like that kick in the pants to like make work. You know, I I just, I feel like I do want to have something to show. And I have generally, since I've always been an artist as a mother um, and I've always had a studio in my home, um, actually the last, our, our homes that we've, that we've lived in. I've had a studio, but in our apartment that we lived in when we first moved here, I didn't have a studio. I just had a little corner, you know, um, but I've always made it work, but I've always had to work quickly. I've always kind of had that mentality of need. I, I do everything kind of fast. I talk kind of fast. Maybe that's noticeable, but I'm just that way, I guess. But, um, but I've always had to 
paint in small pockets of time. So I, I've tended to work a little bit on a smaller scale. Um, I do paint larger pieces, but that's not the majority of what I do. Um, and so in that way, like I've always kind of worked that way. So it's kind of conducive to Instagram because I, I have a lot of pieces to share, but I think one way that it has held me back is the exact same thing that you feel this need to share everything you're doing. Um, and this need to have something to show every day. Um, and so I've actually taken a couple of steps away from Instagram in the past where, um, like earlier in this year, I, I took, I took it off my phone and didn't post anything for a whole month. Um, and I, I loved it. <laughs> like I loved it. Actually, I had this whole big plan that has now flown out the window of kind of having just changing a few things about my art practice. Um, I was in the studio so much more. I was doing master studies every day. I was doing, you know, a figure, a figurative work. Cause I, I also, I've always been interested in doing figurative work <laughs> and obviously that's not showing up anywhere on my Instagram. You know, I've done a few like portrait type things for friends and I draw my children and I paint my kids sometimes. And I've posted that a handful of times, but that's not the majority of what I do. Right. So I was so excited about this. I was like, oh, this is going to be my new practice. You know, I'm going to do this every day and just work, work, work. And, and kind of think of my studio more as a sacred space that's like an incubation space, like, like I had said before, you know, to really, and, and have something that I do every day that I never plan to show anybody. Yes. Um, and I haven't kept that up as much, you know, after I came back on Instagram. And I, so I think that, there's something in our human nature that happens to us mentally when we feel this kind of obligation to share something yeah. every day. I mean, I, I don't, I don't overshare in the sense of like my personal life, you know, I don't show anything really on my Instagram of that every, every now and then in my stories, but mostly it's just my art that I, that I put out on there, but. And people get used to seeing it and, and it, I feel the same. I sometimes do this if I haven't posted a day. I think, I need to find something to post and it's quite tragic in a way but but it has it's kept me on my toes and and I like that because in times when I haven't had Instagram or before I would drift a little bit sometimes but I I kind of like a deadline even though I complain when I've got one um I like a deadline because it it, it keeps me in check and that little bit of pressure. And I kind of find Instagram is a little bit like that for me that I, you know, I, I want to, to produce in that way. I think with, with your Instagram and it's, and this is what's so beautiful about it and that you look at each artist sort of page and profile and it really is, it's a perfectly sort of curated space for, for your work. And, your paintings they all relate to each other in that way and it's a beautiful thing to see and that's what people people almost have withdrawals if you don't post them they <laughs> want that kind of tranquility that escape but it's calming it them down <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah but it's a it, it's sort, sort of a pressure on an artist that an artist isn't used to having that kind of pressure oh I've got to sort of show my homework at the end of the day you know yeah. Bit, yeah. It's like, there's benefits to it. Like for all those reasons that, that you said. Yeah. So I'm always kind of looking for a, that balance and also just giving myself permission and space yes. to explore. And like, I love, I love painting the landscape, like I've said, um, but there's times where I, I, it's like you, not that you get bored of what, of yourself and your work, but mm. And maybe this just goes along with like that idea of maybe I'm seeing new things than I was that I wasn't seeing before that I really want to put into my work somehow. And so it's kind of it's like if I if I don't give myself time to work some of that out and paint stuff that I'm never going to show anyone, you know, mm -hmm. just not be afraid. Like the best advice that I that I've recently got, I, like I've gotten lots of good advice over the years. Um, the the best piece of advice was paint every day even if it's just for 15 minutes. That was, that was my friend that had that open house that I went to her open house. And, and that was when I first started painting. And she's like, that's the advice I would give you paint every day. And yeah. I have more or less done that, <laughs> but, um, 
the other, the most recent advice that I think has been the best advice for me, um, an artist named Brian Sindler, maybe yeah. you're familiar with his work. Um, a while back we were in like a little artist Instagram group where we would kind of post on e- about each other's work and stuff like that, which was great. Um, and it connected me with a few other artists as well. Um, but we had a phone call once he, and he was so generous to <clears throat> go through my Instagram with me and kind of point out different pieces. <clears throat> and he would just, he was kind of trying to help me see how I could just move even one step beyond where I had come in that painting, you know, not anything drastic, but like something with a contrast or something with a shape, you know, or anything. And it was just a really great discussion. But the advice that he gave me was to like, in a way, like, don't be afraid, you know, don't be afraid to take that extra step or to include this, like try this new thing. Um, and if you ruin it, you ruin it, you know, yeah. and that's, it's fine exactly. because who cares, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I've even had that thought. You sometimes you post something, you think it's finished on Instagram. And then like a day later you think, oh, it's not finished. I gotta, I gotta change that. So, but don't be afraid. It's still in yeah. my studio sitting there. Like yeah. who, who needs to see it? Who needs to, you know, I can do whatever I want with this painting. I can yeah. put a big Sharpie X on it and you know, who cares? Yeah. So yeah. that has been a really freeing feeling for me to feel like even this big painting that I'm like, I need it to be a masterpiece, like to not be so precious about it. Um, another artist described it as every painting that they do is just like a page out of their sketchbook. They just think of it that way. They don't try to, they try not to be super precious about it. And I, when I have that thought about a painting, it always ends up going somewhere so much better than maybe I initially thought I wanted it to go. Mm. So that's been great advice for me to Mm. Stand in front of a painting and don't be scared. Don't be afraid. Yeah. What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> you know. See, that's that's great advice there. And I always, if I have to do a commission, I always struggle with them because I overthink it. But some some of the paintings I'm most favourite with, um, my most favourite are ones that I've done in 15 minutes and not taking it serious, not really concentrated. But it's come from this place of. Um, detachment in the way like mm-hmm. total attachment to the process but detachment from the finished item and they always right. seem so so fresh but ones that I overthink how do you being a, a mother and, and a wife how do you kind of manage the the time to make art because that's going to be really tricky having those responsibilities and those priorities and still giving yourself time to get into that headspace and to, to make the journey and pack all your things up. And how does that work for you? How have you managed that? That's a great question. <laughs> and if anyone has a good answer to this, I would love to hear it. <laughs> um, I, so I'll, I guess I'll start like the logistic side of it. Um, like I said, I've always been a mom as an artist. So more or less, you know, so I didn't have to go through a big transition of trying to figure out how to go from an art career to having, you know, being a mom, um, it kind of, they both evolved together (laughs) kind of hand in hand. Um, so my kids have always been around it. They've grown up around it. They've, they've just, they just kind of know this is part of our lives. You know, um, there's always paintings laying around and art stuff, you know, I mean, it's, it's just kind of a chaotic existence, I guess a little bit. Mm. Um, but as you can see, it's very quiet in my house right now. So my children are all at school. So they've reached an age where I definitely have larger blocks of time, you know, summer is coming up though. So it will be different. They'll be home. Um, but I, I actually find that I am better at being productive when I have the deadlines and the time constraints on me. Um, so I actually am not even as productive during the day when they're gone as I am when they get home. <laughs> which kind of sounds terrible that I suddenly they get home and I escape into my studio. I'm like, Oh, good. (laughs) You're back. I can just go be productive somewhere else. But no, that's the, I don't, I don't generally do that either, but um, yeah. So I have this block of time while they're in school that I I get a lot of work done. Um, I have always, I don't have much of a routine, I guess I'll say Um, I'm not good with routine. Um, I don't know exactly what it is with my brain, but I, I can be really efficient when I have a deadline and a time frame, like a time 
constraint on me. I can be pretty efficient about, I can clean my house in five minutes, you know? So I, I know for me, when I know that I have a certain amount of time to paint, I can get a lot of painting done. Um, so yeah, I do quite a bit of painting in the evenings as well. If I'm doing studio work. Um, so after my kids go to bed or after it's quiet in the evening, I can escape in there and do my work. Um, trying to think of other. It's like with your husband, do you have a kind of an agreement with your husband or an understanding where you can say, when I wear this hat, I'm at work. And I yeah. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, no, it's basically like whatever I say I'm going to do. He's like, that's fine. Go for it. Oh, pretty. Um, he's very supportive. He's, he is an attorney. So he, you know, he works away from home um, mm. every day, um, but he's very supportive. He is very hands-on as a dad as well. So he's, really on top of, he makes the kids lunches every day, um, before they go off to school, you know, I mean, he's just, he's really a dedicated father and really supportive of me. Like, even if I say, I don't know, I don't know if I should do this, you know, it'll take me away from this or that or whatever. He's like, no, you need to do it. (laughs) That's if, (laughs) if it's important to you, you should, you should do it. So, um, he's really sacrificing in that way, very self-sacrificing. So I try really hard to not, um, take it for granted, you know, um, we have very busy lives. I mean, I guess I'll say like our kids are also very busy. And so they have a lot of things going on in their own lives. Um, I also watch a couple of kids after school every day. Um, so I've got my daughter's friends they They're over here, you know, after school wow. every day while their parents are still at work and, um, and it's busy. They're running around causing havoc, you know, letting mm-hmm. the dog out, who knows what, there's always something going on. So <laughs> It's just fine that I work well in like these little mm-hmm. pockets of time. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. I mean, the kids will come home from school and I'll have my whole dining room table covered in a tarp with like varnished paintings all over it or, mm-hmm. you know, and then, and then I'll whisk those away when they're sort of dry and a new set of something else comes out here and gilding a frame or I don't know. There's always something going on though. Mm-hmm. I kind of work in the midst of it all. I guess that's kind of how things get done <laughs> in the quiet times. I'm doing a lot of business related things like responding to emails and that kind of thing. Um, planning stuff, you know, I do a lot of planner paintings so that that kind of forces you to work because you're out there. That's all there is to do. So that's kind of nice. Um, but yeah, in terms of just like, I just, I somehow it just gets done. I don't know. I think it's just these little pockets of time. I just scoot around and do it. And a lot of things fall by the wayside. I've, I've used the term benign neglect before when I talk about my parenting style. (laughs) Um, We try really hard to like be very involved in our kids' lives and be very, like we have very, I just feel like we have a really open relationships with each other. So we talk about a lot of things. We eat dinner together every night as a family. So that's really important to us. Um, So we're talking with our kids all the time, you know, and I don't know, it's just, it just all kind of Somehow it gets done. I don't know how it does. I really don't know when I talk about it like this. It sounds crazy. (laughs) Are any of you kids um, creative? Are any of them sort of inspired by mom to kind of go down that path or want to help out in the studio? Yeah, well, my older son wants to help out if I pay him. So that's what's interesting to him. Um, And he's he's more like a math brain, you know, um, very analytical brain. uh, he, he's, he's talented at drawing. He just doesn't love to do it as much, but, um, my second son loves to draw. He's, and he's very good. He draws more than I ever did as a kid. And he's actually really talented. And he also, he's always like, I need to figure out how to draw hands. So he'll sit there and work on hands for forever. You know, um, he's, and he's, he's very creative too, you know? So he's, he's into D and D like dungeons and dragons. So he's, very creative, always creating characters and drawing them and making storylines and stuff. My daughter is also very artistic. She loves anything to do with her hands, anything crafting, anything painting, you know? So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they, Mm -hmm. what they jump for in their lives. Um, Yeah. I'd be okay if they didn't become artists, but you know, it'd be kind of cool too. If any of them Mm -hmm. want to do that, my daughter will paint beside me. If I go paint on my porch outside with my easel or something, she'll come out with her table and her canvas. She'll just like go steal stuff out of my studio and just come out with her paints and start painting things. And she's all humming and singing. And anyway, it's fun. So yeah, we have a lot of, a lot of art related things going on in our house. I've always got, I have this whole cabinet full of just art supplies 
that my kids have always had full access to, and they've always just gotten out whatever they want to do. I'll come in the kitchen and she's got like a tarp on the table with like her own paint stuff all over it without <laughs> even, I'm like, this is fine, but sometimes there's no tarp on the table and that's when I get mad, but you know, <laughs> so yeah, there's like, I was going to say though, like the thing that I think is the hardest for me is the mental part of it. So I do feel like I require a long time in terms of like the creative process and like getting into something, like getting really into a painting that takes me a long time. So even though I'm able to like go and paint really quickly at times, like if I'm working on a commission, for instance, or Mm -hmm. I don't know. So it's like there, there, I I require almost like an hour of sitting and staring at the wall in my studio before my brain is really able to like produce what I want it to, or I don't know. There are times where I know for myself, I need to take that time to just sit and like Mm -hmm. work out in my sketchbook, a plan for like a show that I'm going to do or So I do find that even though I can work quickly on things, if I'm coming back to something like without having gone through like the whole process of being able to like work out problems or things like that, I always seem to come back into it right at the beginning of the problem again. So I'm like, oh, okay. It's this again. I got to (laughs) like mentally try to work out this problem. And so those things can be hard. And I don't know if that's just as a mom or if it's just the way I am, you know, I get easily distracted. So I anyway, come back to something, but then I, I realize I'm just back at square one again anyway. Mm. So. <laughs> and there is that artistic thing as well. I was explaining this yesterday that um, often I'll do a brush stroke and then I'll go and stare out the window for five minutes yeah. and I'll go and yeah. pace around, do, go back and do something. It's, it's, it's not a linear thing where you kind of start the painting and then just follow it all the way through. There's a lot of dithering and procrastination and not being able to click going up and I don't have the distractions that that you do in that sense of those responsibilities and but I completely understand it and sort of working as an artist maybe people think that you just turn up the studio mix your paint and you start painting and then that's all you're doing all day but there's a lot of lot of um yeah. sort of time that that's not happening it's um yeah there's so much preparation yeah Mm -hmm. that goes into I mean even for me like I prepare a lot of my own surfaces and so and I cut them myself you know so I'm in my garage first and then I'm in my studio gessoing and then I'm you know who knows like all the steps and then finally you get to the point where you're painting something but then it's like what do I what am I painting you know so then you got to go for me I, I sketch a ton and so that has actually been really helpful for me over the years because I tend to paint if I'm not painting plein air and I'm painting in my studio. I, I don't paint from photographs really very much at all. I mean, sometimes I'll, I'll use it as a inspiration or jumping off point. Um, but I don't use it. Like I don't print out the picture and have it beside me or anything, but I will paint often from my sketches. So I do a lot of value sketches in my, in my sketchbook that I kind of bring with me everywhere I go. Um, and they're just real quick jots, you know, real, real sketches, real sketchy sketches. Um, And I'll paint from those and I'll sometimes have notes in there about color or the time of day, that kind of thing. But often it's just a sketch with nothing. And I just use that as a point of reference to create Mm. a painting from. So I, for me, that's actually been really helpful because when I get into the studio, finally able to work on something, I kind of have this like store of ideas already in my mind of what I want to be doing. And it has actually helped me as well to work kind of more in a series um, and think of what I'm doing as part of like a, a full collection of work. I didn't used to do that. It's probably been really since COVID that I started working that way more in ser- in a series. Um, and mm-hmm. I think the reason for that is because I had all of my paintings from England actually that I had done on that one trip. And my plan for those pieces was to show them at a gallery out in Utah. They had a big show ready, like we were going to do it in May of the COVID year, but it was obviously before we knew that COVID was coming. And so that was all set up and it was going to be a a big event and a big opening and all of that, like a solo show. Um, And then COVID hit and they said, well, let's postpone a year and hopefully things will be better by then. And I just didn't want to wait that long. I felt like I have all these paintings done, you know, like pretty much done and ready to go framed even, you know, I was ready to go and I just didn't want to sit on them that long. I get kind of tired of my work if it sits around that long. So I'm like in a year, I won't even want to show these to anybody, you know? 
that's not true with those paintings. Somehow I look back at those and I, I love them still. So, um, but I decided to do uh, my own show. And so I just did it as an open house. It was still during COVID, but it was finally when the lockdown was over and people could get out. So I just had a very limited number of people that like in the schedule you to come mm -hmm. through our mm -hmm. home and see all the cases, all the paintings. And then I did an online component and I just realized that, that, that it worked for me in that point yeah. at that moment. Yeah. And I think the, those couple years of COVID for whatever reason were really successful for me as an artist. And I don't know if it was true for other artists, but I was like, man, yeah. people are just buying was, art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was for me as well. I mean, I really, really, I kind of launched in a way in 2019 and then 2020, obviously COVID and, you know, just for so many, even my teaching as well, because so much was on, on Zoom and right. I'd never been on Zoom before. I was always, oh God, uh, how am I going to do this? But it, it sounds weird, but COVID in many ways helped get me where I am now. Where should people... That's interesting. I... Oh, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry oh. to say this, because we're so late on time now. Yeah. Was yes. Gonna ask, where oh, we're going to have... Yeah. yeah. Where should people go to see your work? Do you have a website? Do you, you know, where's, where's the places you'd like us to... Um, so my website is just aaronspencerart.com um, and I'm on Instagram, Aaron Spencer Art. And I definitely am active on Instagram and that's a good place to find information, up-to-date information on what I'm up to. But I also have a newsletter through my website. You can sign up for that. Um, yeah, that's basically where you'd find me. So <laughs> All the links in the description. I mean, we could talk for another five hours. I'd love for you to be on the podcast <laughs> again if, you would, uh, if you'd be able to find yeah. the time. It'd be lovely to talk to you again. Yeah. That'd be wonderful. It was great. I'm so glad I got to actually like talk to you in person and Richard to kind of meet you in person yeah, here. <laughs> absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. It's lovely yeah. to meet you. And next yeah, time if I ever get out to England again, I need to come absolutely. and paint with you. Yeah, good. <laughs> All right. Nice to talk awesome. to you. Lovely. Yeah, thank you. Later.